Thank you everyone for joining us today. And thank you, Carl, uh, Clay and Rolf for offering to present about your work. Uh, this webinar is part of a, a smart charging webinar series with the aim of finding out who's doing what on uh, smart charging to help inform rolling out uh, a future-proof EV charging infrastructure and collaborate where it makes sense. In the UK, this is specifically relevant because right now there are so many policy developments. For example, there is an open consultation on smart charging where government wants to hear uh, industry insights, for example, on what are the ingredients of a smart charger. Uh, the deadline is actually um, on the 7th of October, so you still have a couple of days uh, to submit your response if you're interested. In parallel to the consultation that will uh, become a new law on smart charging, uh, government is also sponsoring a standardization effort on energy smart appliances, including uh, electric vehicle charging. Uh, and so uh, the aim of this webinar is to get to know who's doing what to help inform these developments in the UK. The webinar is uh, is uh, an activity of the Alan Turing Institute uh, group on vehicle grid integration, uh, but also the Supergen Energy Network. Uh, the vehicle grid integration at the Turing is a new group, and part of what we'd like to do is to apply and develop data science methods to help modernize transport elect electricity infrastructure. If you wanted more information on the group, uh, uh, please get in touch. Okay, I wanted to briefly talk about the electric vehicle ecosystem so that um, we can have a better understanding of where open ADR fits. So, uh, charging management of electric uh, vehicles is key uh, to help uh, reduce the need for reinforcing the power system, the distribution and transmission network, but also to increase the uptake of renewable energy. And uh, there are many energy and mobility entities involved in uh, those energy uh, EV charging management strategies, and they need to exchange information and control objects. So information such as what is the state of charge of the vehicle or what's the state of the electricity network so that we can develop the control objects as an example, reduce the power rate of the charging. And communication protocols provide a set of rules to facilitate this communication and data exchange. Uh, in the EV ecosystem, uh, that uh, this diagram we see on the right, where we have a third party operator that could be a car company in the future, maybe operating those charge points. As an example, it could be an aggregator, it could be charge point operator, it doesn't matter as long as there's some sort of communication between this third party operator and either the electric vehicle supply equipment, the charge point, or ideally, if we are, uh, if we have the charger as part of a house, controlling that uh, charging through an energy management system. In today's uh, webinar, I'm hoping to maybe understand from Rolf uh, more about how open ADR fits in this. Can we control uh, a charging um, uh, charging post? through an energy management system using open ADR? Can we control the charging post directly through open ADR or maybe we need to employ open ADR and OCPP? And anyway, so I'm looking forward to hear the presentation of Rolf uh, and of our uh, uh, speakers from Southern California, Edison, Carl Biso and Clay Collier from ChargePoint. Before we start with Rolf, I wanted to mention that the slides and the recordings will be available on our landing page. Okay, Rolf, uh, up to you. I'm going to stop sharing my screen now so you can share yours. Okay, sounds good. Thank you, Miriam. So let me uh, bring up my slides here. Okay. Do you, uh, can you see my slides? I can see your slides, yeah. Perfect. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for the introduction, Miriam. Uh, glad to be here. Uh, in fact, I just returned from a conference in Germany and uh, uh, where we were talking a lot about uh, demand response, of course, but also electric vehicles and how they can 
at the end of the day help uh, balance uh, the grid and increasing numbers of renewables. So I think uh, this is certainly very timely and um, we are seeing a lot of activity here in the, in the US on that as well. That's why we have uh, our colleagues here from Southern California, Edison, as well as uh, Clay from ChargePoint here to kind of give you an insight of how these things actually work in practice. So let me start out uh, by uh, briefly giving you an overview of how OpenADR works and how it fits in. Uh, Miriam already showed uh, an interesting architecture slide that sort of outlines how this, uh, this, this whole standards map looks like. But for those of you that have not heard of uh, OpenADR before, um, it is essentially a communication protocol uh, that uh, allows uh, for a demand response service provider or operator, and I'm, I'm purposely leaving that a little vague here. It could be a utility, it could be uh, here in California an ISO potentially, or anybody else that sits upstream from the actual consumer uh, that is managing a demand response um, or distributed energy resources program. So these signals come from a server uh, up in uh, at this uh, uh, service provider. And typically we communicate uh, through existing internet. So with other words, we can go through a broadband that is available in residential or commercial settings. Um, or uh, potentially, if needed, uh, it can, of course, also go uh, through a um, other gateway device, maybe a cellular modem, uh, if, the, uh, if there is a need for a dedicated link or if the system is sort of far out uh, away from uh, common access here. So generally, we see uh, these connections working really well, again, with, with existing internet. And um, the OpenADR uh, specification is a web services protocol. So with other words, it uses uh, pretty straightforward uh, HTML um, signals and uh, the code that is being used is XML uh, that is being transported here. So let's, uh, let's look at the entities here a little bit. Um, I already sort of mentioned that uh, you know, it can come from anybody, utility, aggregator, ISO, anybody that operates uh, some kind of a grid stabilization or DR program. And we call these entities a VTN or virtual top node. So that is a system, and I'm specifically calling it a system, not a device or anything, because it can sit anywhere, really. It can be a physical server uh, sitting at the utility. Uh, it can be part of an utility IT infrastructure that's already in existence, or of course it could sit in a cloud environment. So with other words, uh, it is very flexible. It can be really literally inside the utility or it can be uh, uh, attached to them uh, through uh, web services on the outside. So where, wherever that sits, um, it can uh, function as this uh, demand response and DER management system, which then creates uh, the messages. So um, it knows about all the resources. So the resources are uh, registered with the virtual top node and are being activated based on uh, the request from the utility side, which can either be automatic or manual. Uh, via input from utility operators. So then the VTN creates uh, these uh, OpenADR event messages, and we'll get to that in just a second, and uh, can also, for instance, request feedback and other um, uh, things, other information elements in return to that. Now, conversely, on the other end, uh, the VEN, the virtual endnote, very much uh, same story here. So you can have an actual gateway device, a little box that sits in your office, in your building, uh, somewhere you know where uh, you, you need the access, or it could of course be part of a larger uh, control system. And that's where uh, we see it being uh, used, for instance, for the EV, uh, EVSE systems, EV uh, charge systems, uh, where the VEN, and you will certainly see that in the, the use case slides later from my colleagues, um, 
where it sits in the actual uh, charge station control entity or control system. Um, so that uh, VEN, that virtual end node, that client system, will receive then the messages, of course, from uh, the uh, top node and uh, cor correspondingly will uh, work through these messages, see what is it that they need to do, um, and then respond back to the VTN. <laughs> the, the main notion of OpenADR, I should mention that uh, right away, is really not to turn off or turn on a charger. That's not what OpenADR does. We don't turn on or turn off air conditioning, lights, things like that. Uh, but rather, the OpenADR protocol is there to convey informational messages. So with other words, it could be a price signal, it could be an energy request, uh, one way or the other, um, and, uh, and so on and so forth. So there could be a whole uh, blur of things that, that are being communicated here. But again, we are not there to, uh, to, to exert control over these systems that don't necessarily belong uh, to the utility or to the VTN operator here. All right, let's uh, move on real quick to the different services in OpenADR. So the most important one is the uh, OpenADR event service, and I will get to that in more detail in just a minute. Um, but uh, briefly, just on these other services, we have what's called an opt service, where the uh, resources can essentially publish a an availability schedule for, uh, for their uh, involvement. Um, we have the report service where feedback, uh, either a real-time consumption data or forecasts or historical data can be uh, sent back to the VTN, so back to the server. And then we have a fairly low-level registration, the register party service that uh, really just gets the initial communication going when um, a new a VEN connects to the VTN. So all of this, as I mentioned, uh, happens through uh, XML payloads, through existing broadband uh, connections for the most part, or as I mentioned also, so, uh, potentially through dedicated internet connections. So now let's look a little bit at the event service itself. There you go. <coughs> Excuse me. You can uh, imagine uh, an event in OpenADR very, very similar to a calendar invitation. So for instance, uh, for this webinar today, um, you know, you may have uh, received a calendar invitation or the registration system may have sent you one or, you know, you put it in your, in your calendar yourself. And typically uh, that calendar, calendar notice would have a start time and an end time. That's, those are sort of the key functions, of course, of a calendar uh, entry. However, <clears throat> there can be a lot of other things in there as well. So uh, you have a whole text body, right, where you typically can put in an agenda and you can say, okay, from uh, now from uh, uh, 1600 hours to 1605, you know, Miriam is speaking 1605 to uh, 1625, uh, Rolf is speaking, and so on and so forth. So you get, you, get the, you get where I'm going with this. We can do the same thing in OpenADR events, basically. So we have a start time, as you can see here uh, on the screen. I'm actually not exactly sure if you can see my mouse, uh, my pointer moving here, but uh, slightly on the left side here uh, of that timeline, you see the event starts, right? So that's basically, um, the, um, the time that's, uh, that's being published. And uh, for OpenADR, from a technical perspective, this can be n right now, in 10 minutes from now, in two hours from now, in three days from now, or in a year from now. So just like with a calendar notice, for us, it doesn't really make any difference when the event starts. And we are even seeing now that um, more and more uh, these messages are being used for ancillary services. So with other words, fast demand response uh, requests. So they can be even in the uh, four a second range or minute range or maybe 15 minutes uh, at most. Um, if you're very interested, you can 
research a little bit in uh, Hawaii. <clears throat> They're looking at very fast response times there because they, they have the need to balance their grid with their increasing uh, renewable energy installations there. So that being said now, we have a start time and an end time. And you see here something of a ramp period. Uh, this is because we don't really want a, uh, a change happening in all the resources at the same time. We would get obviously quite a spike uh, in a certain area where the events are called. And uh, therefore we have a randomized uh, ramp period in here. <coughs> Excuse me, where we see um, where, or where we give the VENs the option to start an event uh, within a certain time frame and they should randomly pick that. That way, this engagement curve is, is going to be a little more flat and not really a spike in either direction. But now, more importantly, you see under that timeline that we can have a whole host of different signals in here. It could be price, right? Here, for instance, <clears throat> just one price point for the entire time of the event. Um, but there could also be different prices over the runtime of the event. So with other words, every few minutes, the price might uh, change to a different, uh, a different number, you know, during the day or during the afternoon. You know, that is totally open uh, to the program. And then there can be a number of other uh, uh, signals with dispatch levels, you know, give me energy back or here, can you take more energy? All of this is, is basically possible. And we call these, these little uh, uh, sections or these agenda topics, if you will, we call them intervals. So there can be as many intervals in each event as you, as you would like, depending on the program uh, that is being uh, run again by the operator and what is necessary there to uh, to really uh, get all of this done. All right, so um, that being said, um, we have had uh, really a um, an increase here over the last uh, couple of years <clears throat> with a lot of trials and we'll hear about uh, Southern California Edison here in the in a moment. Um, but we are seeing like a lot of changes going on. And we recently had a symposium in San Francisco where we were talking also to our electric car manufacturers. And uh, they even uh, told us that uh, they might be looking at receiving, for instance, open idea price signals even in, a, in the car directly. Oops, sorry. Uh, no, come on, go back. Um, because um, a lot of the especially more like residential or, or small, uh, small business uh, charging systems, they don't necessarily uh, manage themselves, but rather the car uh, can manage when it should start the charging process, when it should stop, you know, what are the requirements of the customer? Uh, does the car need to be 100% charged at a certain time in the morning? Or is there flexibility to say, yes, we can start charging later when the price goes down and things like that. So all of this is possible and the car makers are also looking at, at these items. <clears throat> However, that is then a little bit detached from uh, these, uh, these uh, new uh, generation uh, EVSE uh, systems that are uh, most likely more in the commercial and public space. And uh, again, we'll hear more about that from, uh, from Clay and, and Carl later here. So anyhow, um, definitely of interest for the utilities here. And uh, it's, uh, it's really a good resource from a demand response and grid flexibility perspective. Uh, but it is also a great way uh, to engage the, uh, the customers here. So, that being said, a couple of use cases. Again, some of them I'll run through very quickly because we'll, we'll hear from, uh, uh, from those folks in, in just a few minutes. Uh, but as I mentioned, uh, Hawaii uh, is really ramping up their um, renewable energy uh, uh, strategy. Um, as some of you, uh, I, I think I see some folks also dialed in from the US. You, you probably know that, that uh, Hawaii has a very aggressive goal of going 100% renewables um, very, very soon. Um, so they're really looking at all the different components here 
And um, we see here certainly this, uh, this type of infrastructure where <clears throat> we see the open ADR signal uh, being used, um, like I said, with an event message. Uh, and that goes to a cloud-based control system. Uh, and from that uh, control system, it then manages uh, the different uh, chargers, potentially battery storage and, and other systems out there. So there's a, there's a multitude of different uh, resources that can be connected to this to manage the overall uh, power flow and to stabilize uh, the grid here. I'm not going to go into Southern California Edison uh, uh, <laughs> here because we will hear from Carl in just a minute. So I'm going to move on. Just wanted to show you this for you, those of you that are really interested in the uh, technology behind it and you know real scientific calculations. Um, there is there was a really interesting uh, study uh, done in Eastern uh, Europe. Um, I think Vattenfall was involved and a few other. Uh, folks there uh, in in uh, Slovenia, um, they have this uh, shipping yard uh, with um, you know all kinds of systems. They have a battery a storage, they have solar, they have a, a fleet of electric cars, <clears throat> and all of this was essentially uh, brought together into a virtual power plant or microgrid, you know whatever you want to call it, and. Um, same thing here. So we're getting from the, the energy market, uh, the, the open ADR signals, either prices or, or energy related messages. And then downstream, there were other standards being used within that shipyard to manage all these, these different units here together. And the link is going to be here on this slide, uh, which uh, as Miriam said, will be uh, available. Uh, for download uh, after the after the webinar, so you can check this out. Uh, very technical paper, so uh, so very interesting here. Also, um, this is a bit of an older slide from a recently started a global grid integration project. Um, it's essentially led by some European companies. A um, bit of a push from the EE bus community. Um, this is another standard that's you know available or possible to use to the charge station directly, and uh, a lot of car makers um, have been involved in here. As you can see, there's a good number of uh, folks there, and and also on the U.S. side, uh, Pacific Gas and Electric was uh, was asked to participate, and um, uh, through them, uh, the Open ADR Alliance is involved here to help. So same story here again, OpenADR is being used to a management system, which then in turn can communicate, for instance, with EEBUS or OCPP or, or even if necessary, proprietary standards, even though we, we tend to dis discourage that, but uh, it's possible to the individual charger. A reason for that, I should briefly mention that, um, is that um, the, um, the charge station itself requires very specific communication, which, and, and Clay probably has uh, way more experience uh, with that, of course, which, which is more related to the customer, the customer account management, the connection, charge times, things like that. So this is not something that we typically uh, do in OpenADR. Um, certainly, we, we, we could potentially add signals for that, but that's really not the idea behind OpenADR. As I mentioned earlier, the idea is to inform and motivate that charge system as a whole and then let, let them make their intelligent decisions because that's not up to OpenADR to decide you know, how they should <clears throat> accommodate or not accommodate in some cases uh, the requests that they receive from the utility. So that's the general uh, setup here. And uh, like I said, we'll see more overview, I think, from Clay and uh, Carl here in just a minute. So from our uh, perspective, we have seen, uh, again, of course, the, the EBSE manufacturers. Uh, we have had, uh, in fact, a lot of them join uh, in the last, uh, I would say, 18 to 24 months, uh, join the Open ADR Alliance, which, by the way, is a nonprofit organization based on, on members, and we are hosting the OpenADR standard and the certification program. 
Um, but as I mentioned, uh, we also see uh, the automotive manufacturers uh, really kind of stepping up their game here, you know, with all the electric cars that we are, we are, are starting to see on the streets. Uh, of course, they are very, very interested in the infrastructure and uh, the utilities play a, a big role here together with the car makers to enable uh, these charge systems out there in, in the field. So a very, very uh, interesting interactions going on here. That being said, uh, battery storage uh, should not be underestimated here as well, uh, because in the overall context of uh, flexibility in the grid and uh, demand response and distributed energy resources management, batteries will play an increasingly important role here uh, to, to make sure that everything is balanced and uh, for some, of course, an electric car can also uh, represent just simply a resource as, as a battery. So we might see more vehicle to grid interactions coming up in the future, but I think we're not quite there yet. All right, uh, just a few utilities here. I already mentioned them all, so I'm not going to uh, read out. These are well, some of our uh, strongest uh, 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 members here working on this, but there's, there's uh, some all over the place, including Japan, Korea, China, and so on. And uh, we're seeing more now in Europe as well. All right, so uh, these were, this is just again a list of uh, the different activities. You can uh, look into these uh, in details. You can Google them if you want. There's a number of things going on. The GTIP project at the bottom here that I mentioned before, but there's different working groups in different uh, industry alliances and activities. And uh, of course, also in uh, California, the California Energy Commission is working heavily on, on a number of these things also together with the California Public Utility Commission, the, P the CPUC here at the very top of uh, this list here. So feel free to, to research that a little bit. All right. <laughs> From our end, um, yeah, again, we are a membership organization. Of course, we want to make it so that our member companies can, uh, uh, can easily integrate their products. So with other words, we, we try to align with, uh, with other standards, OCPP, uh, uh, one of them, uh, as Miriam mentioned, and I think in her slides was also the 2030.5. Um, so we can also talk about that. Um, but uh, we're also working on more case studies and we have a program guide on our website which already includes some of them and we are in the process of updating these. And then of course we, we participate in all kinds of other uh, related uh, activities and we will be at Distributec this year and if one of you happens to be at the European Utility Week in Paris uh, next month, um, we will be there as well and you can feel free to to seek us out there. <laughs> so that was it from my end. Um, here's my contact and some uh, contacts from other folks in the Alliance here. Um, so um, without further ado, I think, um, Miriam, did you want to uh, do questions on that now or should we maybe just keep them all for the end? Uh, I think we usually keep them all uh, to the end if you don't mind. Yeah, perfect. Excellent. Thank you. So then I'll, I'll turn it over here to Carl. And Carl, I'm going to display your slides. All right, that would be great, Ralph. OK, perfect. Uh, just uh, let me know um, when I should proceed. <laughs> All right, uh, sure. As, as Ralph mentioned, I'm Carl Visa with Southern California Edison. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, our charge ready demand response uh, pilot today. So Ralph, yeah. Uh, so the, the Charge Ready program, uh, Ralph actually showed a slide earlier that was a, a different project. That was our, our workplace charging pilot um, where we used electric vehicle uh, supply equipment on our own sites um, and tested a variety of different um, pricing strategies to kind of understand uh, the tolerance for, for drivers and, and our ability to control charging stations. Um, and then a lot of the learnings from that actually have gone into this uh, Charge Ready program. So. Uh, the SE Charge Ready program is a $22 million pilot. Um, we're trying to accelerate the installation of electric vehicle charging stations for non-residential customers. Uh, the initial goal was to install up to 1,500 uh, level uh, one or two charge ports. Uh, the, by far, the majority ended up being level two. I think we only have one site that opted to go with a level one charger. And we're targeting four different long dwell segments, our, our workplaces, 
uh, destination centers, fleets, and multi-unit dwellings. And we'll talk more about those segments uh, in a little bit. So as part of this project, SCE will install and maintain the supporting electrical infrastructure at no cost to the participants or the customers. Um, and then the programs or the participants uh, will receive uh, rebates to purchase chargers uh, and they'll own and operate and maintain the actual charging stations. Go to the next slide, there's a little graphic uh, graphical representation uh, of that. Um, so all of the, the green on the left uh, and even the conduit and wires uh, is the infrastructure that's deployed by SCE um, and covered by the charge ready program. Uh, and then the yellow <clears throat> represents the qualified EVSEs that the customer will choose. Uh, they'll receive some rebates on those. Uh, and then as, as part of uh, them receiving these rebates, they agree to participate in a demand response program. Uh, at, at the time Charge Ready was launched, we hadn't developed the, the program, so we're still in the, the pilot phase with uh, developing what that DR program will, will look like. And that's what I'm gonna talk a little bit more about today. So if we go to the next slide, um, so for the, the demand response piece of the of Charge Ready, uh, Open ADR 2.0 is a requirement for participation. Um, we schedule uh, events uh, a day ahead. Uh, there are five uh, EVSC communication vendors that are currently participating in the pilot, um, and the load control signals that we're sending uh, call for a 50% uh, reduction in the charging capacity of the charging stations. Um, so the, the goal of this project is to encourage uh, EV adoption. Uh, we wanted to try and avoid ever completely turning a, a charge station off and felt like we could accomplish our goals with just a 50% reduction. And, and we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, in a minute. At the bottom, there's just kind of a, a very high level uh, architecture program showing that you know, we send the open ADR signal direct, uh, from us, from our demand response automated server, which is the virtual top node. Uh, that goes to our five vendors. Uh, ChargePoint, who we'll hear from next, is one of those vendors. Um, and then it's really up to the vendor uh, you know, to determine how they can communicate with the actual charging station. So there are a variety of different protocols that are used uh, to implement the actual control at, at the charging station. All right, if we go to the next slide, we can get into a little bit more of the, the pilot design. So uh, with the, the demand response pilot uh, with, with ChargeReady, uh, we split into two different types of events. Uh, our load reduction events, which are more uh, traditional demand response. We're just trying to reduce load at a certain time. Uh, in this case, it's primarily the summer months from 4 to 9 p.m. Uh, that's the, the target area where we're trying to reduce load. So we're doing that by uh, sending a control signal, as I mentioned, reducing charging capacity by 50% during that time, and also offering an incentive uh, for each kilowatt hour that uh, you know, the, the customers, the site host is able to reduce uh, from a baseline during that time period. <clears throat> the, the part that was a little more uh, challenging and was something new uh, was our load shift events. So we, in, in California, because of lots of uh, renewable generation, um, especially uh, during spring months, there are times where we may want to increase uh, electricity used from the grid at, at certain times. Um, and we identified, uh, electric vehicles as a potential resource for, for doing that. Um, and so we developed this uh, idea of, of shifting loads. So uh, the idea is that we will implement uh, controls in, in the morning to reduce the load that they're drawing uh, when the vehicles are charging in the morning uh, with the idea that some of that load will shift to later in the day. We're targeting 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. as the time where we wanna increase load or use more electricity from the grid. Um, and so again, we're doing that by implementing controls beforehand and offering incentives during that period for uh, all of the KWH that's, that's used. Um, so this is just an overview of some of the specifics of the different types of events, uh, when they'll call, the incentive levels, uh, and that type of information. Uh, if we go to the next slide, uh, there's a little more uh, information about load shifting. Uh, the, the top uh, chart there, is a load shape of all four of the segments that I mentioned earlier that are participating. Uh, so you can see that we've got a, a peak at about 9 a.m. The goal is to try and shift that peak to later in the day to after 11 uh, when there's more renewable generation uh, available. Uh, the bottom graph shows uh, you know, kind of our <clears throat> uh, load shape in Southern California for 2015 in red and then projects out what it's uh, anticipated to look like uh, in 2021. Um, we refer to that as, as the duck curve. And so the idea is that that event window in green is when we're trying to increase load um, to try and keep more of a, 
a balanced uh, load shape um, you know, throughout the day. All right, so if we go to the next slide, um, the, the next uh, several slides will just kind of show the load shapes for the different um, segments that are participating, and then we'll get into sharing some of the results. Um, so this is our, our workplace. This is by far our largest segment. Uh, this represents 42 sites and 767 ports. Um, this is the data from, uh, from August of 2019, uh, but we've seen it pretty consistent throughout uh, the, the project. Um, so, you know, uh, we're seeing a peak at, at 9 a.m., uh, and the goal is that it looks like there's lots of load that we could shift uh, that load to, to later in the day and, and have it be used when there's more renewable generation available on the grid. If we go to our next slide. Our destination center segment is, is similar. We, we still have that morning peak, um, but then we have more consistent use throughout the day. Uh, again, some of these are, are city and county buildings, you know, buildings that are where, where people come and go more than your typical workplace, where they, you know, come to work, uh, plug in in the morning, and then, you know, don't leave till later in the day, but, um, you know, ha, ha, are fully charged after a short period of time. Um, so these are our, our destination centers. We also see that these are used much more on the on the weekends than we saw in, in workplaces, um, but primarily uh, load that could be shifted from morning hours to later in the day. If we go to our next slide and, and look at our fleets, um, a very different load shape than what we saw earlier, which we would expect from, from fleets. Um, you know, with our fleet customers, the electric vehicles are out, um, you know, driving throughout the day, and then at the end of the day, they come and, and plug in so that they'll be, you know, ready to go for uh, the next day. Uh, and so primarily the load that here is, is occurring in the evenings. Um, so this would be more suited rather than our load shift events to our load reduction events. We're trying to reduce usage from 4 to 9 p.m. Uh, through a combination of controls and incentives. And then if we go to our last segment, uh, these are our multi-unit dwellings. Uh, this is the smallest segment. Um, this segment, although these are uh, commercial sites, the, the drivers uh, and their behavior is more similar to what we would see at, at, a, at a residence. Uh, and it also matches our, our fleet sites a little bit where you know, not a lot of charging is occurring during the day. Uh, most of the vehicle charging is occurring uh, in the evening or, or night hours. Um, so again, this is another segment more suited to our load reduction events. All right, so now let's talk about some of the results. So I, I mentioned uh, earlier that our load shift uh, events uh, were, were kind of the, the most difficult, and, and that was kind of the, the new thing that we were trying with, with this pilot. We really hadn't done uh, much of that uh, previously. So uh, in 2018, when we launched this pilot, uh, the control period we initiated was from 6 a.m. to 11 a.m. Um, we, we did see that the load during the morning hours reduced from anywhere uh, between 17 and 24 percent, depending on the event. Unfortunately, we didn't see any of that load that was reduced in the morning hours uh, shift or increase during the 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. time period. Uh, in fact, we saw a decrease during that time period. Um, so, you know, that got us going back to the drawing board a little bit, and, you know, one of the ideas we came up with is that perhaps our control period events were, were too long in the morning. Um, you know, having a, a four or five hour control period, even though the vehicles were charging at a reduced rate at, at 50%, it still gave enough time for vehicles to fully charge. Uh, it just would take twice as long uh, prior to that 11 a.m. time period where we wanted to increase load uh, after that. Um, so as we prepared for our load shift events for 2019, um, we made some changes, decided to reduce that control period, and, and if we go to the next slide, we'll see the results from, from 2019. Um, so as I mentioned, we reduced the control period to just two hours from 9 a.m. to 11 a.m., uh, anticipating that there would be load that would, that would be available to shift uh, to the 11 a.m. To, to 3 p.m. time period, um, and it seems like that hypothesis was correct. Um, and over the course of six events that we held uh, this spring, um, we, we did see uh, a shift start to occur. We, we still saw the, the AM load reduced during that two hours, anywhere from 19 to 35 uh, percent, but then we were starting to see the, the load shift. So when we compare to uh, the, the baseline period, um, which is a, essentially an average of the previous week's uh, you know, normal usage, when we compare to the baseline, we're seeing a shift of anywhere from one to eight percent. Um, and then if we look at the actual day and just compare 
um, you know, the amount of load that was reduced uh, compared to the amount that increased at 11 a.m. to 3 p.m., uh, we're seeing anywhere from a 5 to 36 percent load shift uh, on the, the day of the event, again, comparing the amount reduced in the morning uh, to the amount increased in the afternoon. So obviously, you know, in a perfect world, we'd love to see the, the same amount of reduction uh, shifted to, to later in the day. Um, I, I don't know that that's a reality, but, but getting up to um, you know, 30% shift uh, is, is certainly showing progress um, and, and showing that we're able to, uh, again, through a combination of controls in the morning and, and incentives, um, you know, during uh, the 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. time period, uh, we're able to, to shift that load and influence um, the, the drivers and, and the charging uh, that they're taking. Um, so the, the short control period seemed to work. We're still doing additional testing analysis um, as we look to uh, develop uh, a load shift program that, that these vehicles can participate in. Um, if we go to the next slide, uh, this is just a summary of our 2019 load reduction events. As I mentioned earlier, this was much more straightforward, something that we had a, a lot of um, uh, history in, in doing. Um, so for our load reduction events, the control incentive period is the same. Um, it's that 4 p.m. to 9 p.m. Uh, time period. Uh, we, we've seen load reduced by approximately you know, 16 to 23 percent on these two events uh, that were held in August. Um, and we actually did have another load reduction event just last week that I don't have the results from yet, uh, but we anticipate it will be in the same range. Um, you may have noticed that in our load shift events uh, from 2019, uh, there were about 70 sites participating. Um, here there are fewer sites. Uh, that, the reason for that is that the majority of, of the sites participate in this program uh, are workplaces, um, and many of those uh, really didn't have any load during the baseline um, uh, or the baseline calculation period or the event day. So we just excluded those if there was no usage during that time. Um, so that's why there's some variation uh, in the sites and ports uh, that are participating uh, compared to our, our load shift events. Um, uh, but again, as, as I mentioned with our load shift events, we are continue to do uh, testing and, and analysis um, so that we can determine uh, what a uh, real program will look, will look like as, as we scale this up. I would mentioned uh, earlier that for phase one of Charge Ready, um, it was a $22 million uh, program to uh, try and encourage the adoption of, of electric vehicles. Um, after that, there was a, a bridge funding period that, that essentially doubled that amount, um, and, and we've also filed for what we're calling Charge Ready Phase 2, uh, which would provide funding uh, for the next five years and, and provide um, you know, in, in infrastructure and, and incentives for uh, tens of thousands of, of charging stations in, in the future. So we're trying to make sure that we uh, can develop a program that will be, be scalable, um, and meet the needs of both the drivers uh, and the utility over the course of the, I guess we're getting close to 20 events that we've had total between uh, the, the two years. Uh, we, we really have received no complaints from, uh, from drivers um, or uh, site hosts uh, when, when we've implemented our events um, and uh, adjusted the charging capacity at the electric vehicle charging stations. Um, so that's kind of a, a summary of, of where we are and, and where we're going. Uh, we actually did file uh, an advice letter to extend this pilot for another year into 2020. Again, just to make sure that we can really uh, understand uh, our ability to uh, both shift and, and reduce load and, and make sure that we uh, develop a program that will be appropriate for all parties. Excellent. Uh, thank you, Carl. All right, uh, the next is uh, Clay uh, from uh, ChargePoint here. Let me see that I get this up and running. Okay, can you see that okay? Yes, thank you. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak today. Shall I save five minutes for questions at the end? Yeah, I would say, you know, five to 10 or so, whatever works. Yeah, we have probably okay. a little more time anyways here. Okay, so ChargePoint is a, is a company that is focused 100% on charging electric vehicles. So, you know, our, our whole objective here is to fit this in uh, so that it, it's a graceful vehicle grid integration for the utilities with minimum impact on the grid. Can we go to the next slide, please. 
So the one, the only interesting statistic I will share about ChargePoint is that we have a database of 60 million charging sessions that we've conducted. So again, it's, it's, what we've, it's all we've ever done. It's all we do. And, um, you know, we're a leader in growing in it. Next slide, please. I would like to go through a few projects that we did. So I was a founder and CEO of Keysensum, which was acquired by ChargePoint last June. And these are some of the projects we were doing both before and with ChargePoint. The first one was we actually did the first V2G demonstration at, at scale. So at the LA Air Force Base Space Science Command, we orchestrated the management of a fleet of electric vehicles of about 30 cars, buses, and trucks. And the objective was obviously mission accomplishment first, sufficient state of charge to accomplish every leg of every journey every day. But at night, we would interface to the Cal ISO and participate in their four second energy market. That means every four seconds, the Cal ISO hit me, uh, sent us a set point that we wanna hit on the circuit with the electric vehicles and every four seconds we hit that. So they use it as a balancing asset for the grid. We did that for 18 months. So we proved the case that you could use car batteries in a, you know, four, four second is a pretty quick market. So we had to do an optimization engine that managed the control. And again, as Wolf pointed out, open ADR is an information protocol. We developed that at Akuacom. Uh, as an information management system, not a control protocol. So we used OCPP or SCP, or in some cases, a, a cloud to a controller mechanism to control the actual cars and open ADR as a uh, information signaling mechanism. So Rolf also mentioned uh, something that became important in our second showcase here, which was energy storage. In this case, we worked on uh, an energy storage and photovoltaic generation implementation for DC fast chargers. So we had a couple DC fast chargers, with four hoses under that canopy of photovoltaic. And behind that fence, we had Second Life batteries. So the objective here was to minimize the demand fees accrued by charging on that circuit. So we set a peak, you know, whatever peak we agreed was the maximum utility peak. And then we managed to that peak with the throttle of the energy storage system from the Second Life batteries and throttling the rate of charge in the DC fast chargers. The photovoltaic is a trickle. There's really nothing to manage in terms of uh, a variable control there. But the combination is, well, A, I think it, it will be important in the future. Energy storage systems have to come down in price before they pencil out. But absolutely, that makes sense. And B, it's, it's an obvious pain fix because you don't, you, you don't want to accrue demand charges in EV charging operations that blow your business model. And then the third one, we worked with Santa Clara Valley Transit to do the first uh, dynamic management of charging of an EV bus fleet. So Santa Clara Valley Transit was using charge point chargers and we provided the management optimization to minimize, and again, the, the demand peaks so that they don't accrue um, a liability for demand fees. And we did learn a, a big lesson. Those are big vehicles. When you're doing bus and truck fleets, the battery could be 500 kilowatt hour battery, and you may have 100 buses. So you're going to go to utility scale faster with a fleet of electric vehicle buses and trucks than anything else. And that's, that's one of the sweet spots for optimization. May we go to the next slide, please? So here's what we did, and this was all about open ADR. So Alameda County had implemented an open ADR um, program with PG&E, and then, then they in installed both public charging and internal fleet charging stations with no controls at the parking garage. So we, again, there, there was a very clear pain point that we were uh, developing peaks of charging that were causing massive, A, demand uh, fees, and second of all, destroying the curve that they had implemented for, for an open ADR shed. So we implemented 
smart charging control mechanism with a simple, very simple, just state of charge. All we needed to know was what your objective state of charge was if you parked in public. We knew we had complete management capability of the internal fleet. So we optimized getting rid of the big peaks and filling in any gaps with uh, charging windows. Uh, and that, that was a great project because that, that was an eye opener for everybody on, you know, do energy efficiency first, then do automated demand response, then do car charging. They build on each other and you should pay attention to the, to the curves. Next slide, please. So what, what we've done is develop these three software suites. EcoSite is the optimizer that I mentioned that minimizes the peak energy in conjunction with building load. So as you have uh, in particular, a lot of the sweet spot for commercial industrial campuses for demand response also happens to be a sweet spot for car chargers. In some cases, some of our big high tech campuses may have a thousand EV chargers. So you're managing both the, the preliminary shape of the building curve after it's been modified, and then you're fitting the EV charging under that. Then EcoFleet is the software we used for the original uh, LA Air Force bus to manage the fleet, and then the Santa Clara Valley Transit and the bus and truck fleets we work with. It's a dashboard to give you visibility on the status and objectives of charging and to manage the optimization of the charging so that you have minimum demand peaks. And then EcoGrid is what I mentioned where we integrate solar and stationary battery just to flatten the utility load coming into the, call it a microgrid, call it a uh, DC fast charger with storage. May I have the next slide, please? And we don't have a lot of time. I just want to go through a couple slides showing what happens here. So here's, here's a case where we move the peak charging so that we can get the peak demand fee rate. What would have been based on 250, it's down to 225, and we could save 850 bucks a month in demand charge savings simply again by you know it's a very precise peak where the building and charging loads are both at their high and it's and we can shift that so that we do the reduction minimize that peak and give you the money back so we fix that pain and may we go to the next slide please and, and in this case literally you know you're going to get that peak demand only a few days per month so it's A, it's a minimum effect on the actual charging, and B, it's a fairly minimal frequency that it has to occur in. And I'll just do one more slide or two, two more slides and then we'll uh, go to questions. Here's an example of, uh, this is the um, ChargePoint campus. So ChargePoint Campbell, uh, we have, you name it, any kind of car chargers. We have, uh, and we do demos with trucks. So we accrue some pretty significant charging shapes on top of the building shape. And we had that exact same problem where we were accruing a demand fee. So what we did was optimize, minim, you know, there's a minimum window in which we reduced the charging rate at, you know, some number of 20 vehicle, 20 chargers at a time. It did not impact the state of charge accomplishment by the end of the day, but it did reduce the peaks and minimize the demand charge fee. All right, so I, I think we're out of time for this. Why don't we go to questions and um, for everybody. Excellent, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, Clay, for this. And again, uh, people will get the slides to, to take a look. So uh, Miriam, maybe uh, back to you. Or, uh, do you wanna guide us through some uh, potential questions that are there? And, and things like that. And uh, sure. Yeah, thank you, Rolf, Clay, and Carl. Uh, I can start with asking some questions. Meanwhile, our, uh, the participants, if they have questions, they can just type it in in the message option in Zoom, and then uh, we can read it out. Uh, to start with, I have a question for both uh, uh, Clay and Carl. Uh, in order for you to be able to uh, control the load, so control the rate and maybe the time of these charging events. Did you have to rely on the customers inputting the state of charge of their car or did, or did you have a way to automatically uh, know what is the state, state of charge of the car so that when you are controlling this charging, 
you kind of you are sure that by the end of the charging event the customer has enough energy on their uh, car to travel which is the pi- primary purpose of charging an EV and then after that we would uh, take care of the grid so Carl I'll take a first shot at that so we had different instances of, of how that got implemented for the Alameda County implementation that I mentioned you know we knew what the state of charge initially and finally for the fleet vehicles had to be and we developed an app for the consumers that parked upstairs they tell us we need okay 20 kw so you did rely on them on that case yes okay fast chargers when we're dealing with uh, buses and trucks we variably almost invariably have a, a digital communication from the charger to our cloud service and we know we know what the state of charge is Be- because you know the- sorry because in that bus and truck i assume you're using the chademo protocol exactly so and, for- and with the chademo it allows you uh, the chademo protocol is the only protocol that can give you the state of charge right so when when we have that we get it and then um Carl, did you want to say anything about this, that question? Sure, I'll, I'll go ahead and, and mention uh, how we handled that. Um, so in the Charge Ready uh, pilot, as I mentioned, these were all uh, level two chargers, and, and we did not know the state of charge of, of the vehicles that we're driving. Um, also, our relationship is really with the site host who owns and manages the charging stations uh, rather than the drivers, although we do have communication to the drivers through uh, you know, both our participating vendors and the, the site hosts that are there. Um, so unfortunately, we really didn't have a way of knowing that the state of charge of, of the vehicle. And that's one of the reasons why we chose to only implement controls at a, at a 50% reduction um, and, uh, you know, try and, and make sure that uh, customers definitely uh, had enough charge to, to get where they, where they wanted to go. But it, it certainly is a challenge. Understood. Do you think for, for this case, uh, getting the state of charge uh, in the vehicle is crucial for uh, appropriate charging management strategies. And do you think here the responsibility is on the car companies to ensure that third party operators uh, get this information? I mean, I think it would certainly make it, it easier. I, I think we have demonstrated that it it may not be uh, you know, an absolute requirement where, where we have been able to, you know, pretty successfully do some managed charging. Certainly, I think we could get a lot more creative um, with the strategies that we could implement if we could know the state of charge of the individual vehicles. Uh, although I think we would also need to know, um, uh, you know, the, the state of charge that they needed or, you know, the, the commute that, that they needed to drive, something like that to, to really uh, implement it to its full potential. Okay, thank you. Uh, I still don't see any questions, so people, if you have questions, just type them in. Meanwhile, I have a question for uh, Rolf. Uh, on one of the slides, but then I'm not sure if it was uh, from uh, Clay or Carl, but, but it had open ADR on one side, and on the other side, it had uh, different protocols to communicate between the charger and the car. Uh, from open ADR perspective, uh, is that easy for you to uh, deal with the different information objects that are coming from these different protocols to get them to open ADR? Yes, actually, very good question. We, we get that a lot, uh, Miriam. So, uh, you know, people always tend to ask, uh, is there some kind of an adapter or a translation really between open ADR and other standards? And <clears throat> the the key thing to understand here is, and uh, I, I briefly mentioned it, and I think Clay also mentioned it again, um, that is, the difference is here that, again, open ADR is there to inform and motivate, right? So we are sending, let's say, let's say if we send a price a signal uh, to the, the charge uh, uh, control system, the it is then up to the charge control system to decide what to do with that, right? So do they pass on the price to the customer via their login or, you know, uh, do they just use it for charges or, you know, whatever it is they can do with it. So with other words, there is not really a need at all to specifically translate between open ADR and these more control and command focused uh, standards, but rather 
you use this incoming OpenADR signal to uh, execute your strategy, depending on you know what what it is that that you have lined up, and then you execute it using different control and command standards. And that is the case for pretty much any any implementation of OpenADR here with uh, with other other systems. Um, and it's also the beauty of it, really, because like I said, we are, we are not trying to turn off the light or to turn off the charger. So we leave that to the intelligence of, uh, you know, vendors like uh, Clay or operators like Carl to really, um, you know, specify what needs to be done in which case. Uh, and again, this is really important to understand about OpenADR for any and all connection with other standards. You, you don't really need a translation, so to speak. You know, you just want to receive the information from the utility and then you do your thing. And that really opens up for manufacturers to really get, uh, get clever and smart about this, right? Um, they, they can apply their intelligence and that also enables different vendors to have different tools and for different environments and things like that. So we are not tying down a vendor like ChargePoint, like Clay, um, to very specific actions, right? So we leave it open to them. So, and therefore, you know, it's it's a little, uh, maybe maybe a little abstract to envision this, but uh, that that's how it works. You know, we give you basically some motivation and, uh, and, and you then execute on whatever is needed. So to just make sure, maybe I understand, but as you say, it's a bit hard to visualize, but let's say uh, a utility uh, is sending a signal, it is sending it through open ADR, and then uh, a charging point manufacturer will have to deploy either its own, let's say, communication protocol or use OCPP to control that charger? Or, that or is correct. yes. Yes, so, so to, to give you like maybe a really simple example, um, so let's say, let's say Carl uh, SCE needs, um, let's say 100, 100 uh, kilowatts in a certain area of, of the city, right? So they may send a message out <clears throat> to the uh, EV uh, charge uh, control system that uh, says, hey, in this zip code or at this feeder level or you know whatever the the identifier is, we need a hundred kilowatts. So now Clay's system can kick into gear and say, okay, how can we provide Carl with a hundred kilowatts in that area, right? So so they go through. Okay, we have active charge uh, stations. They're charging right now um, and okay, we can temporarily reduce their charge level, for instance, for a certain period of time without inconveniencing the customers. But we may rotate around, right? We don't want to like just turn off one charge station or two uh, and basically end up not charging the customer's car, but rather, okay, let's reduce the, the load on, uh, on one charge station for five or 10 minutes, then we swap to another one and another one and another one, et cetera. You know, so I'm not, I have no idea. <laughs> That's all Clay's, uh, uh, Clay's uh, forte here. But um, so essentially the open ADR signal is received, is terminated, is done, right? It did its thing to tell the control system that they need that power. Now the control system kicks into gear and, and works their magic and then uses, like you said, Miriam, any kind of standard that they want. I mean, they could even technically use OpenADR. And I mean, we have seen uh, OpenADR going down to specific devices. I mean, it's, it's possible, you know, but, but it probably makes more sense to use, you know, whatever uh, standards they want to uh, uh, have here for their customer management and the charge uh, station management itself, uh, because obviously there's a lot of other things going on there between the uh, charge uh, station back end and the actual charger. So not only not only a smart grid and utility related uh, activities. What, what if this 100 kilowatts can come not just from cars, but maybe from stationary storage, but maybe from uh... Uh, other devices in the house, for example. 
Exactly. You know, that, that is exactly right. I mean, uh, of course, you know, right now, since we're, you know, in the beginnings of all these efforts, you know, we, we probably see fairly dedicated um, EV programs. So, you know, there would be a, uh, a specific signal, you know, for these, for these EV uh, uh, SE uh, systems, but conceivably it couldn't be any, any other uh, resource out there, and that's what we are already doing with with OpenADR in general, right? For demand response, so can be an HVAC system, can be a solar system, a battery, you know, lighting being dimmed or increased, and things like that. So yes, everything, uh, all of this goes, and hopefully in the future we might actually see more integration. And uh, we see that I think in some of these microgrid projects where they really try to combine both, you know, charging stationary batteries, solar, um, things like that uh, with, with um, HVAC control and, uh, and things like that to, to really balance these microgrids. So yeah, it's all possible. Thank you. Um, okay, uh, we have a question uh, from Roberto. Uh, Roberto's asking with enough information on the current state of chargers, the cars and other entities, a clear whole picture is understandably easy to get. Uh, let me see. Okay, lost the chat. Okay, and therefore to take appropriate decisions when you have all this information coming from the different entities. Um, are you able to identify what is the minimum uh, uh, information needed uh, to provide uh, a, a usable service? Ooh, that's a good question. We could try to do that on the fly. So if, if you have a, first of all, OpenADR is an aggregation mechanism. So what I need to know is what is the array of loads that I can shape? Is it 50 electric vehicles or trucks? What is it? What is the capacity that I can modify over what duration in order to define the actual shape of that um, ADR asset? So Carl, or you might want to say something about your objectives and your pilot to shift and, and the volume you're trying to shift and the amount of cars you have. Sure, and, and you know, really we were just trying to see how much uh, of the available load we, we could shift. So, you know, as I mentioned earlier, we had pretty limited uh, information. Um, you know, basically we knew, you know, how many charging ports we had. We, we had looked at the load shapes that I had showed for each of the different segments, so we knew when the majority of the load was occurring. Um, we did get uh, some session data from the actual vendor, so we had an idea of how long the vehicles were charging and, and some of those types of things. Um, but I would say we, we had pretty minimal information um, that, that went into our uh, original pilot design. Um, uh, but again, based on the information that we had, you know, I, I think we've been able to be successful in both reducing and shifting load. Great, thank you. Uh, last question. Uh, do you foresee a few, maybe a recent a future where we see open ADR mostly used in the states where EE bus is used in Europe? Um, for my end, I think again, you know, we're talking about the two different pathways, right? The EE bus is also more of a a control uh, system. Uh, I have to admit, though, that I'm not uh, familiar with all aspects of uh, the EE bus. Um, so I, I'm I do sorry, think I'm asking that, this because when you mentioned that EE bus, uh, sorry, when OpenADR was uh, used in Europe, uh, you said something. All the efforts were from EE bus, and and I I was surprised to hear. I thought, why would we not use OpenADR? Oh no no no. So maybe maybe I didn't make that clear enough. There there, there is OpenADR being used exactly the same way. Um, uh, Carl and uh, Clay also just uh, pointed it out. It's just that they actually have. Um, a um, uh, one of their participants and one of their fairly active participants is the EE bus initiative. So they are actually looking to um, use EE bus instead of OCPP actually. So so on the on the lower end of the communication uh, pathway here. So the open ADR involvement is the same as we saw in the in the other slides that. Uh, 
that we presented today, just again, instead of OCPP, the one other option would be EE bus there. Okay, great. Okay, uh, Rolf, Clay and Carl, thank you so much uh, for all the information you provided and everyone else, thank you for joining. Thank you. Okay, I'll make the uh, presentation and video available online uh, unless, uh, uh, unless you, you tell me otherwise. Yeah, no, totally fine, totally fine from my end. Yeah. Great, okay, thank you, bye. Bye, take care.